It's no secret that Boeing has had a disastrous decade or more of public misery and, well, disaster. Finally culminating with the most recent Starliner failure and embarrassment of NASA having to turn to Elon Musk and SpaceX to save the entire program. But what if I were to tell you that about a decade ago, Boeing and NASA conspired to never let SpaceX into the NASA and Boeing family at all. And NASA almost did just that. More on that in a minute. But if you're a fan of mafia or gangster movies such as Goodfellas, The Sopranos, or The Godfather, then you're familiar with the term made guy. And if you're not, well, a made guy or a made man swears an oath to an organized crime family and holds the rank of a soldier in the mafia. Made men are the only ones who can rise through the ranks of the mafia, from soldier to cap regime to consigliere, underboss, and of course, maybe even one day become the boss of all bosses, the Godfather. However, while becoming a made guy holds many privileges, there is one privilege that is regarded highest above all others. And that was that a made man is protected and untouchable by fellow family members and criminals alike. And he is to be protected and feared. To strike at a made man, let alone delete a made man for any reason without the permission of the family bosses, well, let's just say you would be deleted yourself. And that is regardless of whether you had a legitimate grievance or not. But for nearly a century in aviation, there was no bigger or untouchable made guy than the Boeing Corporation. They were literally untouchable. That is, until a new family sprung up in the neighborhood. And the boss of all bosses and godfather of that family, well, you know him as Elon Musk. But Boeing wasn't going to have a rival gang selling product in their neighborhood, oh no. So what do you do? Well, you go to war, of course. And that's exactly what Boeing did. With the help of another organized family, that being NASA. And that war began in earnest in 2014. In the early 2010s, as NASA's shuttle program was winding down, NASA needed to find a new way to get astronauts to the space station. So they put out open bids to aerospace contractors for the privilege of shuttling NASA astronauts back and forth to the ISS and even someday to the moon. So by 2014, NASA whittled down its commercial crew competition to three players, Boeing, SpaceX, and Colorado space plane company Sierra Nevada Corporation. Each had its own advantages. However, like I said, Boeing was already a made guy and basically untouchable, with decades of flight experience. However, hot on Boeing's heels was the new rival gazillion dollar SpaceX company, which was already working on a capsule of its own, something they called a Dragon. However, some NASA insiders also nostalgically loved and were drawn to Sierra Nevada's Dream Chaser space plane, which reminded them of a little baby space shuttle. Now, the rest of the story comes from an excerpt from Eric Berger's new book, Liftoff, the story of the rise of SpaceX. Eric Berger is also a reporter with the website ARS Technica. In 2014, as the new capsule competition neared a climax, NASA prepared to trim the bidders down to one company, or at most, maybe two, to move on from the design phase into actual development. In May of that year, Musk revealed his Crew Dragon spacecraft to the world with his characteristic Papa Chaplum at an event at the company's headquarters in Hawthorne, California. With flashing lights and smoke machines, Musk literally raised the curtain on a black and white capsule. He was especially proud to reveal how the Dragon would land. Because never before had a spacecraft come back from orbit under anything but parachutes or gliding on wings. But his new Dragon would change all that. Or that was the plan, anyway. It had powerful thrusters called Super Dracos that would allow it to land under its own power. Musk gleamed that you'll be able to land anywhere on Earth with the accuracy of a helicopter adding which is something that a modern spaceship should be able to do anyway. But John Elbon, a longtime engineer at Boeing who managed the company's commercial program, was not impressed with SpaceX performance to date, noting it's only a handful of Falcon 9 launches in a year and an inability to launch at a faster pace. Well, that didn't age well, did it? Anyway, as for Musk's Little Dragon reveal event, Elbon was also not impressed. Elbon said, here at NASA, we go for substance, not pizzazz. Well, there's a word you don't hear much anymore. Pizzazz. Anyway, that spring, the companies were finalizing bids to develop a spacecraft and fly six operational missions to the space station. These contracts were worth billions of dollars. Each company told NASA how much they needed for the job, and if selected, would receive a fixed price award for the amount. And of course, Boeing, SpaceX, and Sierra Nevada all wanted as much money as they could get. 
However, each had incentive to keep their bids low, as NASA had a finite budget for the program. However, of course, Boeing being Boeing and the only made guy in the room told NASA forget about those other guys, SpaceX especially, because Boeing needed the entire commercial crew budget in order to succeed. Besides, after all, many decision makers in the NASA family believed that Boeing, and only Boeing, had what it took to safely fly astronauts. Well, that didn't age well, did it? But the scary thing is Boeing subterfuge very nearly worked because NASA was going to do exactly as Boeing asked. You know, Boeing made them an offer they couldn't refuse kind of thing. But after the final bids were submitted in July 2014, during this initial round, experts scored the proposals and gathered to give their opinions. First to get whacked was Sierra Nevada Corporation and their cute little dream chaser because their overall scores were lower and their proposed cost was not low enough to justify remaining in the competition. This left Boeing and SpaceX with likely only one winner. Phil McAllister, director of NASA's Commercial Space Flight Development Division in 2014 said, We really didn't have the budget for two companies at the time, adding that no one thought we were going to award two. Yet I would always say one or more, but people would just look at me and roll their eyes. However, Boeing asked for $4.2 billion, 60% more than SpaceX's bid of $2.6 billion. The second category was mission suitability to assess whether the company could meet NASA's requirements and actually fly crew to and from the space station. For this category, Boeing received a score of excellent above SpaceX's very good. The third factor was past performance evaluated a company's recent work. Again, Boeing received a rating of very high where SpaceX received the rating of just high. Berger writes that while this makes it appear though the bids are relatively even, and NASA Chief McAllister said the score differences in mission suitability and the past performance were in fact modest. It was a lot like grades in school. He said SpaceX scored something like an 88 and got a B, whereas Boeing scored a 91 and got an A. However, because of the significant difference in price, McAllister said the Source Evaluation Board assumed SpaceX would win the competition. And he was thrilled because he figured this meant that NASA would have to pick two companies, SpaceX based on price and Boeing due to his higher technical score. But he said he wanted the competition to spur on both companies. So the decision was to be made on August 6th during a meeting at NASA headquarters. The agency's head of human spaceflight, Bill Gerstenmeier, convened his top human spaceflight advisors in the agency's Space Operations Center in a secure room that was built after the Columbia accident in 2003 for high-level strategic meetings. Gersten Meyer and about 20 senior officials at NASA sat around a large rounded table discussing the source evaluation board scores to pick a winner. After a presentation on the technical scores, Gaston Meyer asked each advisor for their opinion. These were a who's who of spaceflight community, many of whom, like Gersten Meyer, had come up in the space shuttle program long before the era of commercial space. However, as he went around the room, each person echoed the same response Boeing. First five, then ten people, then fifteen. And this seemed to really please NASA head Gersten Meyer, known warmly as Gerst in the global spaceflight community. And he encouraged potentially dissenting voices to fall in line and pick their made man Boeing or else. Hmm, sounds like Challenger, Columbia, and the Max. However, as McAllister watched this cascade of pro Boeing opinion sweep around the table, he said a building an unbreakable wave of consensus began filling him with horror. I'm freaking out, he said, because I could see them going with Boeing, which in my opinion was an inferior proposal. And only with Boeing, he said. Sitting to Gerstenmeier's right and reporting to him as the director of commercial space development, McAllister's mind whirled with possibilities of throwing himself in front of the oncoming bus because he knew that arguing SpaceX had presented the best proposal based on price and technical merit would get him nowhere. Near the end of the discussion, Gerstenmeier asked McAllister's opinion in turn. McAllister started asking questions of his own. First, he turned to Bill McNally, the agency's head of procurement, and asked if he had ever seen a federal agency choose a bidder that cost 60% more when both bids were technically acceptable. Well, McNally shifted uncomfortably in his seat at the question. Eventually, he powdered out loud that, well, the senior Gaston Meyer can do whatever he pleased. But McAllister pressed further, repeating the question again. Have you ever seen this before? And finally, no, McNally replied. That would be uncharted territory. 
Next, McAllister questioned the engineer representing safety and mission assurance, Deidre Healy. When she had spoken, Healy said the safety division preferred Boeing as long as the company performed an in-flight test of its spacecraft abort system. Huh. But Boeing refused and had no such plans to do that. Their bid included a ground test only of the abort system, but not one in flight. Go figure, Boeing not concerned about safety. However, McAllister seized on this, asking Healy, so then you're saying Boeing's proposal should really be considered satisfactory then? Well, no, Healy replied, but still indicating that the bid was acceptable to her. Remember, like I said, Boeing was a made guy. Then another member of the Source Evaluation Board at the meeting, a deputy procurement manager from Johnson Space Center named Lee Pagel, said this question scored points for McAllister. It was strange that so many smart people thought NASA could just snap its fingers and Boeing would conduct an in-flight abort test. He said, in all my years of working with Boeing, I never saw them sign up for additional work for free. Boy, that's a fact. But hey, made guys don't work for free. Anyway, after addressing his questions to McNally and Healy, McAllister turned to Gerstermeyer and laid down the law, saying, I told Gerst he had to pick two. His head of safety and mission assurance just said Boeing's proposal was unsatisfactory, and the head of procurement said the cost would be difficult to defend. And oh yeah, he said, plus Elon Musk sues everybody. Typically, a decision is made at this meeting, but Gerstermeyer said he needed time to think about what he heard. He took another month. During this time frame, someone at NASA floated the idea of a leader and follower, with Boeing getting the lion's share of funding and SpaceX a small amount to keep going. But Musk rejected this idea immediately. At the same time, McAllister kept pushing Gaston Meyer, telling him competition was essential to moving the program forward, as Boeing and SpaceX strove against one another to build the safest, most reliable, and most cost-effective system. Eventually, Gersten Meyer agreed. And the rest is history. And as for Boeing, after needing to be rescued by the same SpaceX they once laughed at, well, Boeing now may be looking at NASA's new made man. But in case you continue to wonder why Boeing keeps getting contracts with NASA and outsiders like SpaceX and Dream Chaser have a hard time becoming a member of the family, well, that's simple. Because the Godfather has always wanted it that way. So Boeing always did whatever Boeing wanted to do. Because they always had the protection of the Godfather. But now it seems there's a new boss of all bosses. And I wouldn't be surprised if soon, Boeing might not be taken for a one-way fishing trip in a canoe. You know, like Fredo. This is Maximus.